Hello there, my name is Simon Jones and I've got a really bad cold, but that is not going to stop us sharing important hit film knowledge to you in the form of this tutorial. I'm going to be showing you how to create this abstract shot using HitFilm Ultimate's Particle Simulator. We'll be covering some cool techniques for creating the motion of the spinning trails and the reflection in the floor, as well as a technique for narrating a video when you can't breathe through your nose. You can download the project file to take a look at using the link in the YouTube description or on the hitfilm.com blog. Let's jump right in. I'm going to be setting up a lot of rigs in this tutorial using point layers. If you haven't got to grips with point layers yet, this is going to be really useful. Seriously, you'll be using them all the time. In fact, let's take a moment. The best way to think of rigs in HitFilm, or any VFX software, is that they're kind of like using a dolly or a jib when you're on a shoot. Sure, you could use a handheld camera for everything, but if you want to get a really smooth, elaborate track or crane shot, you're going to have to use another piece of equipment to get it to work right. No matter how steady your arm is, it's just not going to compare. Animation rigs in HitFilm serve the same kind of purpose. Sure, you could hand animate every single movement, but in a lot of cases, spending a little bit of time setting up a rig will be a lot easier. In the case of these spinning particles, keyframing rotational movement this smooth and perfect would be really difficult. So we're going to build a rig that will not only make it easier, but it will make it absolutely perfect. OK, I'm going to make a new composite shot, and I'm going to call it Source, so that I can remember what's what. I've said it before and I'll say it again, always name your comps and layers as you create them. Any time I don't do that, I find myself hugely confused when I come back to my saved project a few days later. Maybe I'm just a bit slow. Anyway, I'm going to go to the new layer menu and add a new point. I'll change this to 3D using the timeline menu, because we want our rig to be moving about in 3D. Next up, I'll switch the view to perspective, so that I can see what's going on, and use the orbit tool here to quickly set up a better view. You can see the point sitting at the centre of the scene. Let's add a bit of movement to this point. I'll spin open the transform properties and activate the position keyframe. Then, using the select tool in the viewer, I'll hover over the blue arrow and drag it backwards in space. I'll then jump forwards 10 seconds, just by typing it in here, and drag the same blue arrow forwards until it's right up at the camera. But I want the effect to be spinning as well, right? So, let's go back to frame 0 and activate keyframing for the rotation Z property. Or Z if you're in America, which you probably are. We want to use the rotation property instead of the orientation property because it gives us more control and ensures continuous turns. Check out Axel's transform tutorial for more info on that. By the way, a handy shortcut to know is if you double click on a keyframe, it will jump the playhead right to it. So, I'll double click on this position keyframe that I put in just now to move the playhead back to it. I'll then change the rotation property to three turns. This adds a new keyframe and means that the point will rotate three times in the 10 seconds it takes to move between the two position keyframes. Here's where things start to get interesting. It's time to add some more points. First, I'm going to rename this point to center. I'm even going to spell it C-E-N-T-E-R because here at FX Home we like being tolerant of other cultures even when they confuse us. Right, let's add another point layer. This one I'll rename Orbit. I'm hitting the F2 key to rename these layers incidentally. This new point layer needs to be set to 3D as well. On frame 0, I want to make sure this point layer is in the same position as the center point. The easiest way to do this by far is to first parent it to the center point, then go to the Orbit layer's Z position. This now represents the position relative to the center point, so setting it to 0 moves the orbit layer directly on top of the center point. OK, they now start at the same spot. Of course, as soon as we play the video, you can see that the orbit point has now inherited the movement from the center point. In other words, we keyframed one layer, but now have two layers using that animation. Currently, the orbit point is in the exact same position as the center point. That's not much use, so on frame 0, I'll take the orbit point and move it to the right a bit. The reason I'm doing all this on frame 0 is simply because that's the starting point for the movement, so it keeps it nice and simple, but you can make adjustments on any frame you like. Right, if I play the video again, you'll see something interesting happening. The orbit point is now living up to its name and orbiting in a circle around the center point. If I control click on both point layers, it's a bit easier to see what's happening. Basically, the orbit point is still inheriting all of its movement from the center point, but it's now offset. You can start to see the beginnings of our rig. But we're not done. We need more points. Rather than create a brand new point, 
This time I'm just going to select the orbit point and duplicate it by pressing Ctrl D. I'll then rename it Orbit A. Duplicating it like this is useful because it means the point is already in the right place. However, I don't want Orbit A to be parented to the center point. Instead, I'm going to parent it to the orbit point. I'll then move Orbit A to the right a little again. I'll duplicate Orbit A, rename it Orbit B, and move it so that it's on the left of the orbit point. Back on the orbit point, I'm going to activate keyframing for its own rotation Z property, then skip to the 10 second mark by double clicking on one of the existing keyframes, then add a turn of 1 to the orbit point. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our rig. Of course, there's currently nothing to actually see, because point layers are just reference points, they don't actually render as anything, so I'd better set up my particle simulator. I'll drag on a fresh particle simulator from the effects panel. Using its default settings, the simulator will simply spew out particles on the spot. Not very interesting, so the first thing we need to do is set it up to use our nice new animation rig. In the emitter shape group, there's an attach to layer property. Clicking on this will reveal all the available layers. I'm going to choose the orbit A point layer. You can probably see where this is going. If I hit play, you can immediately see the results. The particle emitter is now attached to the point layer. In the particle system properties, I need to change a few things to get the solid stream, rather than the randomly dispersed particles that we have here. First up, in movement, I'll drop the speed down to zero. This means that when particles are spawned, they'll simply stay in place. OK, this now looks like a nice trail. It'd be better if the trail got smaller and faded away, rather than simply disappearing. To do this, we'll change the particle system's lifetime properties. Since the 1.1 update, these are conveniently found in a separate panel. In the alpha property, I'll change the type to gradient, then add a new tab by clicking underneath the gradient bar. The opacity can be changed using the slider, but I want it to be black, which represents transparency. In the scale property, I'll adjust the graph to make the trail get gradually smaller. I'll add a new point to the graph at the end, and set the scale to 0%. Then I'll select the first point, and move it to life 0%, using the value down here. So that's looking pretty good now. This is a bit of a trick, don't forget. While it looks like a moving trail, in reality none of these particles are actually going anywhere. They're simply spawning, staying exactly where they are, and then getting smaller and fading out. It's the movement of the emitter that creates the illusion of actual movement in the effect. You can make out a few gaps in the trail once it gets close. To make it look more solid, all you need to do is go to the particle system's general properties, and increase the number of particles per second. Around 150 seems to work nicely in this case. If you want to lengthen or shorten the trail, it's really easy. Simply adjust the life property, which you'll find in movement. The final adjustment I'll make is to change the color in the appearance group to a nice bold blue. Because we set up two points, orbit A and orbit B if you remember, it's now time to make a second particle trail. First up, I'll go to the emitter and rename it emitter A. Again, just so I can keep track of what's what. I'll then duplicate it by pressing Ctrl D and rename the duplicate Emitter B. In Emitter B's shape group, I'll change the Attach to Layer property to Orbit B. Immediately you can see we now have two particle trails. Thanks to our animation rig, we've also got a fluid, natural looking curved movement that would be pretty impossible to keyframe manually. To differentiate them, let's change the colour of Emitter B. OK, it's now time to get our camera set up. Let's switch to a 2-up view using the Views menu, with Active Camera on the left and Perspective on the right. I'll then move the camera up closer to the start point of the effect, using the position controls in the viewer. I'll raise it up a bit and drag around on the pan controls to get it how I want it. You can set it up however you want, it doesn't really matter, but having a moving camera just helps to illustrate the effect that we're doing. I only need to do a simple camera move, so I'll activate position keyframing for the camera then change the Align option to World. This changes the position control on the viewer to align to the world rather than the layer. If I switch it back to Local, you can see the control changes back to the orientation of the layer itself. I can now skip to the 10 second mark and simply drag on the blue Z arrow to track the camera backwards, keeping the effect in view. I'm going to drop back down to a single view. You can already see how useful and powerful point layers are, especially when set up into a rig like this but let's use them for one more thing in order to make the effect a bit snazzier. From the new layer menu, I'm going to add a new plane, which I'll call Flares. Make sure it's set to black as well. First up, I'll change its layer properties to Add. 
This removes the black, but will let bright objects remain, as you'll see in a moment. From the effects panel, I'll drop on a light flare effect. It's worth remembering this is something that comes as standard in HitFilm. You don't have to buy any extra plugins to get this kind of essential functionality. Opening up its properties, I'll set the hotspot position to use the orbit A point. I also need to change the position properties down to 0, 0, so that there's no offset. You can now see that I have a nice lens flare sitting on the front of one of the particle trails. I'll change it to the flashlight LED type, and tweak the hue shift property in the global group to make it closer to the colour of the trail. You can make further adjustments if you want. I'll now simply duplicate the light flare effect, then switch the hotspot link in the second one to orbit B. I'll tweak the hue shift again to change the colour to something that matches. So now you can start to see the real benefit and the power of using points and setting up rigs. With almost zero effort, the effect is now far more interesting. No additional animation required at all. The other thing that's cool about this is that the light flare effect is actually 2D, but it can still be mapped directly onto 3D points. This does have its limitations, but in most cases it's extremely useful. Even as the effect moves around in 3D space, with a moving camera as well, the flares behave exactly as you'd expect. You can use the rig to add as much detail as you want. For example, in the original test shot, I added a second particle system to each emitter to create the small dust-like particles coming off the main trails. Experiment with some stuff yourself and see what you can come up with. For a bit more visual excitement, let's add a grade layer to the comp. I'll put this below the flares layer because I don't want it to affect the light flares, only the particle trails. Onto the grade layer, I'll add a glow effect. I'll drop its threshold all the way down so that it affects everything in the shot, then boost up its intensity and tweak the radius. Different settings will produce very different results. OK, so that's about it for the rig part of this tutorial. I'm now going to take a look at how to do the cool reflection. And yes, we'll be making further use of point layers. First up, I'm going to go to my media panel and duplicate the source comp. I'll rename the new comp Reflection. Inside Reflection, I'll split into two views again and set the second view to front. Time to add another new point. We need to make sure this is in 3D as well. This point is going to represent the position of our floor. In the front view, I'll just lower the point down so it's underneath the effect. I'll rename it Reflection. As you might remember, our entire effect is based off the center point. I'll now parent the center point to the reflection point. This is the clever bit. In the Reflection Points Transform group, you'll see a scale property. There's a little chain icon, which I now tick to unlink it. This lets us change the X, Y and Z scales separately, rather than as one. In the Y scale property, I now change its value to minus 100%, the minus being the important aspect. As you can see, the effect is now flipped over based on the Reflection Points position. This is in fact a perfect reflection of the original. So now it's time to composite them together. I'll make a brand new composite shot, call it main comp. That's what I tend to do for the main comp. Well, yeah, that's kind of obvious. You probably got that. I didn't have to tell you. Into this, I'll drop the reflection and the source comps and set both of them to add blend in their layer properties. I'll then add a new plane layer. I'll set the size to 3000 by 3000 and I'll call it floor because that's what it's going to be. I'll go with the default gray color. Onto this, I'll drop the clouds effect from the effects panel. This is a really handy effect for giving a layer a quick bit of texture. In the speed group, I'll drop the X property down to zero. Instead of using clouds, you can use whatever you want to texture the layer, or you could even just bring in an image texture. It's entirely up to you. All we need is some kind of 2D plane to use as our floor. Talking of which, we now need to change the plane to 3D. It's currently completely the wrong angle, of course. So in Transform, I'll change its X orientation to 90 degrees. This makes it flat, like a floor. I'll now just quickly jump back to the Reflection Composite shot, which I can simply tab to up on the timeline here, and I'll go to the Reflection layer and copy its position property. Switching back to the main comp, I'll now paste these onto the Floor's position property. Being able to copy and paste between different composite shots can be really useful. This ensures that the floor is in exactly the right place. However, in this comp, I'm still using just a default camera, which doesn't match up with the camera we created in our source and reflection comps. So I'll jump back to the reflection comp again, copy the entire camera layer, switch back to the main comp, and just paste it in. If you have multiple cameras on the same frame, the one on the highest layer will take precedence. So the newly pasted camera immediately overrides the default one that was already there. 
we now have the correct camera movement, which makes the floor look like it's part of the same scene. I'm actually going to go into the floor's transform properties and just scale it up a bit, so that it feels more of the frame. This is probably a good time to turn off the viewer grid in options, because it's just getting in the way at this point. For some extra visual interest, I'll also add a light layer. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, as we've covered lights in other tutorials. Check out our Getting Started playlist if you want to take a look. The main thing is to ensure that it's not separated from the floor plane by the 2D layers, as this will stop the light from affecting it. I'll also go in and change it to a linear fall off and adjust the reach, so that we get a nice looking floor here that gradually fades away. To make the reflection look more like a reflection, rather than just a direct copy, it's a good idea to add a few grading effects to it. I simply threw on a blur effect, set to about 15, and drop the opacity property quite a way down. Depending on what kind of reflective surface you're going for, you might want to tweak that to have a different appearance. Another thing that is worth noting is that the main reason I used embedded composite shots to create the final shot is because I wanted to grade the particle effects separately to the floor. If you were looking to create a reflection for something else, such as text, images or videos, you could very easily do it all in a single composite shot, simply by duplicating the content, parenting it to your floor point, and flipping it over with the Y scale trick. Okay, thanks for watching. Please do subscribe if you like the kind of stuff we do. We've also got a Facebook page where we post up all sorts of cool stuff, a lot of which doesn't show up on YouTube. Meanwhile, if you're a member of the Twitterati, you can follow us over there. Plus, of course, we have the hitfilm.com community itself. You'll find a huge range of great discussions there, and we just revamped the forums to be easier to use than ever before. That's it for this video. We'll be back next week with more tutorials and hopefully healthier presenters.